Hi, I'm David Smith, and in 2013, I hired a team of software engineers and a team of teachers, and we set about seeing if we could reinvent the whole high school experience. In this video, I'll tell you about some of the things we've learned about how education has changed and is changing before our eyes. The idea we have was to see what would happen if we deployed the latest Silicon Valley technology to build a completely new type of high school starting from scratch. We didn't take an existing school and try to improve the IT infrastructure. We took the approach of a tech startup and set about developing software and systems to build an entirely new model for high school education. I've been in the tech business for a long time. Um, I was responsible for global marketing at Apple, and I've been a tech entrepreneur developing software and internet-based systems my whole career. And I've seen a lot of industries disrupted and transformed by technology over the years. Um, there have been advances in education but not to the same extent that we'd seen in other sectors so far. I think education really has been lagging behind. It's not surprising because the secondary education business alone, the more than 600 million students worldwide, more than a trillion dollars a year is spent on that industry. And it's one of the most conservative uh, sectors of the uh, world economy. So we started in 2013. It turns out that the timing was pretty good because YouTube was beginning to become populated with really fabulous videos and uh, open source software platforms were becoming available. So instead of us having to code uh, systems from the ground up like we used to do, when the 1990s, when I was building some of the first web browsers, we could use building blocks. An open source really helped us to um, build more sophisticated systems much more quickly and effectively. We did a lot of listening to students. Um, one of my colleagues spent a lot of time with students take, going through courses uh, online courses that were available at the time. And um, actually, we've collected information and feedback from all the students that have been through our courses since 2013. And that's 30,000 of them. Uh, this thing has really grown very quickly. Um, just in the last two months, less than two months, we've enrolled more than 6,000 students. Um, and one of the things we found is that students are not all the same. They don't all want to study typical st school hours. They want to study when it's convenient and effective for them. They also want to study where it's convenient and effective for them. Um, some of the students are early birds. They like to study early. Others are late. There's a perhaps surprisingly, num surprisingly large number of students that are studying overnight. Um, so two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, you'll find there are students on our platform, hundreds and hundreds of them. And a lot of them, that's when they like to study. Actually, I'm not surprised. When I was a student, that's what I used to do. I used to, um, we used to have be, between the end of school and the beginning of the exam period, we'd have a few weeks. And during that time, my study schedule would be from midnight to 5 a.m. Um, and then the rest of the time, you know, when I wasn't sleeping, I would be uh, uh, out just enjoying myself and having fun over the summer. But um, when everyone went to bed and everything was quiet and there were no distractions, I could get to work and do my study and it worked pretty well. So we're seeing that now with students um, who are working all sorts of strange hours. Um, we're hearing from the students that uh, they like videos. Uh, they're more engaging than lectures and textbooks. Um, 
and uh, they want to go at their own pace. Um, we've had student feedback saying, why do I need to go to a classroom when uh, I can study on online at home and in the classroom, if I'm going to the classroom, it should be to take advantage of having other students in there. I think one of the things that was, has changed the most and is changing is the lecture component. Um, the, the, the teacher standing in the front of the class, lecturing the class on a, giving them the substantive material for the course, that is becoming out of date uh, because those lectures can be delivered through videos and we'll see that, that there are um, a lot of advantages to that. And students and teachers could be doing more effective things while they're in the classroom. Uh, students want self-paced courses. Obviously, with a video, you can stop, rewind, replay, and slow down. And for a student, to master the material, they may often want to replay it as many times as they need in order to, to achieve the level of mastery that they're, they're looking for. But the one thing that surprised me uh, was that we found a lot of students actually speed up the videos. So we have students that are running videos at double speed virtually all the time, some of them. Um, this has had some strange effects. There was one student that had watched all his videos at double speed. So when it came to actually speaking about the material in the video, he would speak at double speed and had to slow himself down. So students, we need them to actively engage with the video. So when they've completed the video, we then ask them a quiz. They complete a quiz to make sure they've digested all the material. Um, but, um, what we can do now is we can start embedding the quizzes into the videos themselves. Now, when you have students studying all hours of day, day and night, you know, they really, they want immediate feedback. And um, with software, we can provide immediate feedback on quizzes and unit tests. Um, we set up an online support system with operators working 24 by seven and a ticketing system that you would have in any kind of Silicon Valley tech company. And the tickets, the questions come in, they go to the online customer service operators uh, who are, you know, as I said, they're working 24 by seven. Now, if the question is that comes in is something like, how do I upload an assignment? Uh, then the customer service operators have a knowledge base of information and they can respond to those questions. They don't need to bother teachers with those types of questions. If the question is on a substantive material for the course, then those questions go to the teachers and the teachers come back with a response. Um, we also have one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring uh, available to the, something that we added in. We got feedback that the students do want to have one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So we have that available by via video conference, we made it very quick and easy to book uh, tutoring sessions. There are no long term contracts required and you can connect with a teacher um, through the online booking system and that all the teachers that we have are fully credentialed teachers. OK, now one of the things we learned in building the curriculum when listening to students and sitting with them going through other courses from other uh, course publishers and schools was that they want to, to, to know where they are. They need to know, you know, how long is this course? Where am I? You know, what's next? And basically a step-by-step -step process of completing the course. We do encourage students to go through the course in the steps that we've laid out, starting at number one, unit one, then go to unit two, unit three, unit four, and so on. But they can jump around if they, if they want to and they feel it works for them. So we've developed uh, more than 50 online courses in our catalog. It's a complete online curriculum. Um, the 
Reading materials, as I mentioned earlier, well, the reading materials accompany the quizzes. The reading materials, there's really no need for textbooks these days. Um, the reading materials are, can be provided through uh, uh, web links, through a HTML. Um, the only books we require are, we just uh, replace some of the old readings in the English language courses with relatively new books that are uh, still under copyright. So they have to, uh, the student has to buy or a book or, or check one out from the library uh, for the English uh, literature courses. Um, and then we have uh, some other um, types of, uh, there's, a, there's a lab kit required for the chemistry uh, course where there's a, there's a book that comes out. Other than that, there's absolutely zero paper in our courses. Everything is online. Um, so we built all these courses uh, covering math, English, social studies, all the typical things that you need to graduate high school. Um, and then we also added some additional courses. Like we have a course on money math, which is really a personal finance course. It teaches uh, students everything they need to know. Well, most of the things they need to know about being an adult, taxes, mortgages, interest rates, credit cards, credit ratings, all those useful things you need to know when you're in the real world. And we actually make that a requirement for the students that graduate with us with our diploma that they take that course. And we get good feedback from students saying that they found it very useful. Of course, we listen to parents. And of course, parents want the best for their children. Um, there are a lot of parents that are concerned about their children being bullied at school, in the classroom, in the schoolyard, on the way to school, on the way back from school. So we have um, taken in students on our, on our diploma program. Um, that are kind of between schools and they, 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 they can't go to school for this reason. We have had other students that uh, just cannot go to a regular school because they're too sick. Um, so there are some reasons uh, for students to, to take an online course. Um, parents obviously want to take care of their children and for most of them, for many of them, online options are highly um, beneficial. Parents want an affordable price. I'll talk about that later. We really slashed the price of courses by implementing the latest technology and efficiencies and so on. Um, they don't want to have to buy expensive textbooks or pay for any other hidden costs when it comes to um, paying for their students' education. Um, essentially, we have parents that will uh, pay for courses when the student needs to catch up. Um, so if the student's taken a course in their high school, they've failed in high school, they need to catch up and get that, um, those credits, they will take the course with us and the parents pay for those courses. Also, if the student wants to jump ahead, in the summer we get a lot of students that want to jump ahead and go into the next school year with uh, additional credits. Um, so the, the pricing is uh, important for parents. And um, they also want to check in on their students. They want to be able to see what progress the student's making and speak to someone um, on our customer service team about how the student's getting along. We have obviously our own teachers. Um, our teachers all work from home. And what we found when we listen to our teachers is that they like to work from home. Um, we used to put out ads hiring teachers and we were just inundated by the best resumes you've ever seen. Um, teachers were, were very interested in the idea of working from home. And so all our teachers work from home. Some of them um, work from home just through, through choice. Others, uh, because they live so far away from the nearest school that they couldn't uh, actually uh, commute to school. It wouldn't be reasonable to do that. Others have small children at home. There are lots of reasons. It's much more flexible. Um, so they like to work from home. Um, they like to be part of a team 
as well. Um, so we have uh, we've been very successful with setting up an, a kind of a, a team collaboration tool where everyone kind of gets together and shares photographs of their babies and their weddings and all these types of things um, online. Although they're working from home, they are connected to uh, their colleagues. And um, we have found that the teachers like to specialize. We get teachers that specialize in developing curriculum. Developing curriculum, a new course, is a big job. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it takes a long time, there's a lot of work, mapping the course, making sure it meets all the standards and so on. Um, and so we get teachers that specialize in developing curriculum. Uh, we get others that specialize in grading and providing student feedback on their assignments. We get others that specialize in purely answering student questions and some of them that do online tutoring. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, there are some teachers that are really enjoy and are good at grading are not particularly good and they don't particularly enjoy developing curriculum. So they kind of become specialists. And um, it's been a, an interesting process working with the teachers that generally we find that teachers en enjoy the online education experience. Now, we provide our curriculum to other schools. After we started, developed our online curriculum, we found that other schools wanted to adopt it for various reasons, um, for, uh, for, for remediation to catch up, uh, for students that need to catch up, um, for situations where their teacher hasn't, uh, hasn't showed up. We had one situation where the teacher's home had been destroyed in a wildfire and they had to uh, take all the courses online. Other schools actually provide, they, they use our online curriculum. And so they're, they're, all their students use our curriculum and they use their own teachers. So we've found, and you'll see in this presentation that a big part of our, um, our business is collaborating with other schools, more traditional schools. Um, and in those schools, uh, what we found is that the teachers, teachers really want to teach. Um, they don't want to waste their time developing curriculum that's been developed. Developing curriculum, it's probably at least a 12 month project for one or two people for one course. It is a major undertaking to do it properly. Um, so we hire those teachers to develop the curriculum and the curriculum involves videos, online readings, thousands of quiz questions, uh, final exams, assignments, everything has to be pulled together and then we submit the curriculum to be approved by the various uh, accrediting and um, authorizing bodies. So teachers in regular schools, you know, developing curriculum has been a major uh, time sink for them. Um, giving lectures, giving the same lecture on the same topic every year over and over again, you know, when the lecture can be delivered through a video and the video is presented by a professional presenter, a teacher who, and it's been professionally produced, it's, it doesn't make sense to stand up, spend your time lecturing students in a classroom. And they, they, they can do it with video, they can run it at double speed, half speed, whatever they like. Marking uh, quizzes and, um, and unit tests and uh, things like that uh, can all be done accurately and instantaneously uh, by software. So marking is something that we, the teachers don't want to do so much of. And then answering questions, you know, how do I upload my assignment, that type of thing. So what we found is that the teachers in the schools want to free up their time from all these tasks. And this is what we can do with our online curriculum. And so with our online curriculum, we've been providing it to dozens of schools so far. We're now um, enhancing it and we're being provided, gonna provide it to schools across the United States um, in a way that it looks and feels like an extension of their own website. And it's very easy for them to adopt and use the curriculum. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit further, but we're calling it our always online curriculum. So this changes if we can free up the time of teachers, um, 
I'll tell you a little bit later about what they do with their time. But um, the schools and the districts that they work in, um, they are looking for online curriculum these days. Uh, I think since COVID, the online, the move online has become much more adventurous. And so most schools and districts are looking for online curriculum and blended learning opportunities. Um, they want their students to be successful. So they're looking for online curriculum where the students get engaged and they don't drop out of the course. That's something that's very attractive to the schools. Um, they want responsive customer service. Um, they don't want long-term commitments uh, to their, their other vendors out there before we came along that you know they lock the schools into five-year contracts and things like that. And um, we've also um, had many discussions being approached by uh, overseas schools that are looking to offer a dual diploma, diploma program. So the idea is that the student studies um, in the overseas school, they take their courses, US courses with us online, and then they earn a diploma in their home country and they earn a diploma in the US through Silicon Valley High School because our courses are online. We can grant diplomas to students living anywhere in the world. And if a student living overseas wants to come to college in the US, they can earn a high school diploma with us. So this um, uh, dual diploma program, the dual diploma concept is something that we've heard the schools uh, are looking for and something that we're working on. Now, when we've freed up the time of the teachers, they're not doing the grading, they're not doing the, well, they're doing the grading in many cases, the final grading, but our teachers are providing the support to their students need uh, whilst they're uh, going through the course, um, but they're not doing the curriculum development, the lectures and all those things. So what do they do? Well, they can operate in a flipped classroom. Um, the flipped classroom is where the students come into the classroom and the teacher leads a collaborative session to work on their homework. They do the homework in the classroom or the assignments in the classroom, and they do the actual lectures at home. So the whole system is flipped. But the flipped classroom, you know, many ways, students, you don't need to go into the classroom for, 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 for time with the, the teacher. I mean, you can have one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher through video conferencing these days. But I think that's really the big advantage here is that the teachers have more time to check in on struggling students. They have more time to personalize the education and, uh, and to track the student progress. They have more information and data. We track, we have more visibility into what the student's doing than any, any traditional school because we track everything they're doing throughout the course, not just when they're sitting in the classroom. So um, we can provide that to the parents, uh, to the, the, the teachers, in the traditional school model. Um, so we went through the accreditation process um, with various accrediting bodies. Uh, Cognia is, uh, used to be called Advanced Ed. It's the largest accrediting body in the world. We're accredited by WASC, um, Western As Association uh, Commission for Schools. Um, the, uh, our courses are approved by the University of California. The NCAA uh, is another uh, approval body for student athletes. And then there are specialist online um, kind of approvals bodies like Quality Matters. So this actually was interesting for us. Obviously our teachers and educators that we have working for us have been through this process before. Many of them have sat, have worked for these accrediting bodies and accrediting schools and so on. But it was interesting and we learned a lot um, through the accreditation process. So we learned about the industry best practices uh, for building courses. Um, we learned that the, you know, our, our approach has been to build rigorous curriculum. We want the students to actually learn the materials. And if the student doesn't learn the materials, they don't graduate from our, uh, from our courses. They don't get any credits, they don't get a passing score. So this is something that 
um, was was something that we always wanted to do. But working with the accrediting bodies, you know, they provide us with more tools, more information. They provide lots of training courses and materials, and um, and also you know helped us to focus our curriculum development on meeting standards, uh, standards that are set by the various standards bodies in the states and um, and elsewhere within the states and nationwide and elsewhere. So um, yeah, the crediting process was um, actually an interesting process and very valuable to us. So we, we, we welcomed it and we found it very, very useful. We set out where all these courses offered by other course publishers and schools were in the 300 up to like $900 range. Um, we wanted, when we set out, we wanted to see if we could offer better courses at $50 each. So that was the original goal. We have designed all sorts of efficiencies using software and technology to build the most efficient school you can possibly imagine. But when we're paying for the teachers and the customer service operators and the people that are mapping the standards, courses to the standards and all those things, we couldn't hit $50 a course. We can hit $125 a course. So that was something that we found um, was a sweet spot. And um, so we're still way below anyway. We've slashed the cost of high school education. And we offer everyone the best price. We have schools that take our courses and adopt our online curriculum. They pay the same price as a parent that pays for one single course. So it's a very simple approach. Like, We've given you the best price, and we that that same price is available to absolutely everyone. So um, that was a learning process. Unfortunately, we couldn't hit fifty dollars, but we do. Uh, we are able to slash the costs of uh, of uh, online courses for, for for parents and for the schools that are buying them. COVID came along, and uh, that was interesting. Uh, COVID came along and really didn't affect us in the sense that all our teachers were already working from home. Our students were already at home. It was just business as usual. We do have software engineers that work in an office generally. They, they all went home and worked from home. But, but you know, there was a point in COVID that I started to think, are we the only school that's just operating as normal? Um, so, it was normal, but it wasn't normal because we obviously got a lot more um, growth. There were a lot of students that came to us. We got a lot of students that came to us and said, uh, we want to do online classes with you because our school is trying to do them and they don't really know how to do online. Um, so we got a lot of those things. And we got a lot of schools approaching us as well. So, um, you know, the, the COVID virus, really didn't, um, didn't hurt us, uh, didn't really affect us except driving some growth. There are issues that we face that traditional schools don't, um, the online viruses, hackers, and the whole um, security systems that are required when you have a busy website like ours. Um, it, it, it's, it's an issue that we have to deal with. And it's on a high, on a large scale. I mean, at any point in time, right now, there are probably our site is being bombarded with 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 hackers trying to get in. And fortunately, we have the systems to protect us. But um, that is a challenge. Online viruses, malware, those things are issues that you have to deal with in the in this modern type of school that we're dealing with. Now. Education in the United States, uh, it's state law, it's not federal law. So every state is different. And some states are wildly different from others. Um, then you have the schools and school districts that have their own policies. Um, 
some of the states like California, for example, the online courses in California are approved by the University of California plays an important role. That's not the case in say Nevada. In Nevada, the government, uh, the Department of Education uh, approves the online courses. All the states have different rules and regulations. They're all very, very different. Some states have no central government control and others have the government control, the, the state control is, is all encompassing. So um, it took us a, a while to investigate this and figure out how this worked. But then we did find a way to get our courses across the whole United States approved for um, adoption by schools across the whole United States. And that's what we're working on with our always online program. When we started out, uh, it wasn't that long ago, I'm talking about 2013. Um, students to graduate from high school, in many of the states, you had to dissect a dead frog and a pig fetus. And students that took courses at home uh, online would be shipped pig fetus and dead frogs and things like this in the mail for them to dissect. And this um, was traumatic for a lot of students. Um, this wasn't that long ago. Uh, so fortunately, the rules in most states have changed. That's no longer required. And because we can do virtual dissections online uh, these days uh, through simulations, the people the other can actually pull pieces of the frog out and move them around and everything through software online. So that's been an improvement and a lot of students are pleased about that. And a lot of frogs and pigs, I believe are pleased about that as well. Another area thing that's changed um, for the better is that the um, conversational interaction when you're teaching a language course we have languages like Spanish. We also have um, American Sign Language. Um, when you're teaching courses like that, you um, have to have conversation with the teacher. So uh, we can now do that through video conferencing and uh, the standards bodies and the various uh, um, accrediting bodies approve that. So we can now offer uh, conversational interaction between uh, the teacher and the student and courses that are approved for credit uh, completely online for science labs as well as for uh, conversational uh, language courses. So these are some of the things that we've seen change in the last few years that are really adva adva advantages and advances. Now, with 30,000 students, the demands on the server are quite intense because when a student's taking a quiz or um, a final exam or something like that, it, it, it requires server capacity beyond just six, you know, browsing a website. So when you have 30,000 students, and you have maybe 10,000 of them on online at one point in time, there's a lot of uh, demands on the server. So yeah, 30,000 is a large school. We, I, I've only found three other schools online that when I, on my searches that, that seem to have more students. And the way that we're growing, I think we will be the, the largest school in the world um, probably within a year. Um, but still, 30,000, it's not a lot when you consider there are 600 million high school students worldwide. And when we're collaborating with other schools to reach those students, the infrastructure that we need on the website and the server infrastructure and the IT infrastructure is quite substantial. So fortunately, we can learn from other huge um, websites and um, Silicon Valley companies about how to scale up to this type of level. And the way that we do this is that um, one server 
can only handle so many students. Um, so if you if you're going to scale up the scale that we're looking at, then what that server what you do you have an infrastructure where when the traffic reaches a certain threshold, the server clones itself, makes a new version, and then spreads the load across. And it keeps doing this as the traffic grows. So you have here a school that needs to spawn clones of itself in order to satisfy the traffic and keep the response, responsiveness going as the, as the traffic builds up and we grow to huge numbers of students. Um, I think education is really starting to fulfill, starting to achieve the potential that it's been promising, that, that online education promised so much from the very beginning, from when I first started um, building web browsers in the early 1990s, you could see the internet was becoming the world's biggest encyclopedia, the biggest library, the biggest educational resource ever made available to human beings. Um, but I don't think it was fulfilling its potential. I think the courses, when you have courses that are text-based, not video-based, you know, that's not really leveraging the best of the internet. So I think education, high school, and all types of education, online education, the technology is catching up in the education sector to where it has uh, gone in other sectors of business. I, you know, broadband is broadly available. Um, devices are generally available. I'm not just talking about the US, but all over the world, internet-based devices. Um, and, you know, looking back, I think, you know, we have already, in many ways reinvented high school. Um, and I think the exciting opportunity here is to reach students that weren't being reached be before or weren't able to tap into a valuable educational resource. I mean, there are students in various parts of the US and various parts of the world where you know, they just don't have the facilities in the local school to, to provide those students with a really high quality education. But with these online platforms and now with this online school, we can reach students all over the world. We can educate them and we can uh, give them high school diplomas that they can help them get into college and, and so on. So this is, uh, I think, is where the, the, the biggest upside potential is for online education. Um, online education is mainstream. It's here to stay. Um, we are building on what we've learned so far here at Silicon Valley High School. We're hiring more software engineers, more teachers, and we're looking to deliver a more personalized and more effective education for everyone. Um, we have this always online curriculum that we're going to be rolling out for schools so they can have their own curriculum that looks and feels like an extension of their own school. Their teachers can have uh, access to, to it and some control over it. And um, we're also um, building a scholarship sponsorship program where we can help uh, the um, exceptional students from underprivileged backgrounds to get an education by matching them with a sponsor who's prepared to pay for a four-year education. And because of the price points that we have, we can offer, you know, for example, a billion dollar donation by some huge uh, charity or someone would educate more than 80,000 students uh, to get a four year high school, uh, online high school diploma. So there are, and I think with that type of thing, and if you can get those underprivileged uh, students who are exceptional and prepared to work hard, give them the chance, that the benefits to society for this could be, could be enormous. So thanks very much. Um, basically, that's where we are so far. 
we started this um, journey in 2013 and uh, we are really, we've made good progress. We technically have built one of the probably top five schools, high schools in the world in terms of the numbers of students. Um, but we're really just getting started and looking forward to this whole wave of change that's going to be hitting the uh, secondary education market. Thanks very much.